Move over blockchain, there is a new tech darling in town and her name is Jen, Jen AI. Poised to overtake us humans in the next coming years unless we figure out a way to control it, generative AI has become one of those transformative technologies not only for business but our society in general. My name's Peter, this is my partner, Sergey. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing good, Sergey. We're with Cradle Point, actually, and you might be wondering, why is a company like Cradle Point here? Well, we are part of the Ericom team. Ericom was acquired by Cradle Point back in April, and we're actually the cybersecurity unit at Cradle Point. So we're here today to talk about cybersecurity. We're going to do some, just some foundational stuff about generative AI and then talk a little bit about how you can protect your corporate data, personal information, other such details to be added to these large language models. So any decent presentation at conferences usually includes memes on every slide, so I figured I'd just get it out the way right now. No cyber jokes, no? No, I don't have any <laughs> cyber jokes. That guy actually took them all. He was really good. So as you're well aware, this generative AI is just burst onto the scene. Now, it's actually been around for a while as these language models have learned over time, but there's projections that, you know, the, the growth in this industry is gonna explode. There is pretty much almost all companies out there believe that it's gonna benefit their businesses. And while it's not the only one out there, you can see ChatGPT has been the fastest growing application in history but we're still at the beginning stages. We still don't know how this is all gonna play out. And you can see on here, so it's actually been around a little over a decade is when they sort of started working on this whole idea of understanding language and those kinds of things. And now today, at least according to Gartner, it is at the top of the hype cycle. So other technologies that used to be at the top of the hype cycle was things like the human brain interface to a computer, which now I guess Elon is looking for folks to become test subjects for his plug-in systems. But as you can see, it's kind of grown over time, taken a little bit, but right now it is right at the top. And then if you understand the Gartner hype cycle things, once it crests and starts coming down that slope, that's when a lot of organizations, a lot of businesses start to adopt it. It becomes more common within business systems and so forth. So Sergey, you're out in the field every day. What are some of the things you know, businesses are using this Gen AI for? Oh, it's all over the place now. Uh, it's been very popular lately. We have a lot of customers approaching us um, asking questions about how they secure, can they secure their data from being exposed to Gen AI tools. Uh, in general, you know, the Gen, Gen AI is, is being embraced by a lot of enterprises. They use it to generate new content, they use it to uh, augment the uh, code writing, uh, they use it to, you know, for some chatbots and customer support they use it to increase the productivity of the employees, uh, and generally, you know, all the good stuff. And uh, Gen AI certainly provides the means and uh, facilities to, you know, provide those uh, those improvements. And even the IRS now is going to use the generative Everyone AI. Everyone uses, for, yeah, um, IRS uses the Gen AI to <laughs> actually go through the returns and uh, kind of uh, churn those uh, into uh, different uh, different buckets, if you will predict and run some inferences, so that's in interesting. Yeah, so, but the thing about this um, is, you know, the whole 90, almost 100 think that it's gonna be great, and 88% uh, of the companies out there have already started to adopt this technology. So they're incorporating this stuff into their backend systems already without really understanding the impact to the business, the impact to the systems, and what potential vulnerabilities could come about after the fact. Even attorneys are using it to write briefs. Doctors are using it. Which it's, is scary, by the way. If attorneys use, use to, Gen AI to write briefs, that is scary, scary moment. I use it to create YouTube titles. That's fine, I guess. 
Now, there are certainly concerns, obviously, out there about generative AI getting integrated in the systems, aren't there, Serge? Well, the, the first and, and the main concern is security. The data security, and how that data is used. Um, the, recently, there was, uh, there was an incident where um, the government, it, Italian government just temporarily blocked ChatGPT for GDPR violations, right? And the secondary thing is just uh, the copyright issues, right? So the, the content, what the model sp spit out, spits out, um, can be you know, subject to copyright. It could be plagiarism. It could be anything, anything else. And the third thing is there is a lot of um, concern when, you know, when it comes to a, uh, cybersecurity crimes. The, uh, the malicious actors use Gen AI to actually uh, help them craft certain types of attacks. For example, there is a, there is a tool that's called the, the PassGAN or the Password Generative Adversarial Network, uh, which can help you crack the passwords pretty easily. And uh, it's a it's very uh, you know, dangerous tool. Uh, there was another one recently, it's called the Fraud GPT. Uh, what it does, it, it helps the, <laughs> the, the uh, fraudster uh, craft the uh, phishing email. You know, so you just put the, uh, the name organization you want to send it to, and the model figures out the rest. It puts the very realistic content in the email. It puts the nice phishing link and obscures it correctly in the email. So, you know, these tools are out there, and they become more and more prominent. They become more and more smart. And uh, it's, it's a real issue. So we got so, regulatory challenges there. Now there's within the current models, the large language models that, you know, the chat GPT, the Google Bard, uh, the Microsoft Edge, etc. Bing, I should say, there is some built in protections against those individuals who want to craft zero yeah. days, who want to craft vulnerabilities. But the, obviously the, the malicious, the the black hatters, yeah, if you will, so have taken some of those and then turned it into their own, as you were mentioning, the fraud GPT. Yeah, there are plenty of open source models out there. Hugging Face, and there are some other resources. Llamas, Shmamas, there are many of the models what the fraudsters can, can use in their malicious intent. And of but, course, the, you know, the public tools are they're trying to fight this type of operations, but you know, they're kind of on the reactive mode, right? And it's just trying to, to prevent something with, they, they don't know what exists. And, uh, you know, the malicious actors, they could take advantage of that. You know, the other thing about data loss, though, is just the fact that people are now copying and pasting corporate information, often proprietary, into these systems to maybe validate their code, like you were mentioning earlier, creating marketing materials. So on a daily basis, corporate, private, proprietary information is getting added to these uh, large language models. Just the other day I was trying to, we're, when we're actually rehearsing for this, I you know, was asking it, hey, can you, can you delete all the stuff that I've given you so that you know, there's no secret sauce out there. And it's like, no, yeah. but you can potentially query, I've seen, can you tell me where you got this information from? Or are there any of your competitors that have entered info into here? And at times it will then tell you, oh, this is from so-and-so competitor right. and they answered it at this time. Well, assuming so the model has an access to the web and uh, it can answer that question. But yes, it is only natural to copy and paste stuff, yeah. right? It's like, who doesn't like that? I mean, there is, if there is an article you need to, um, you know, to work with and to either summarize it, translate it, uh, reword it, or you name it, right? Who's gonna retype it? Who's gonna look through the, all the content, especially if it's pages long? Uh, it, it is natural, people just copy and paste, copy and paste all over the place. And it happens every single day. So, you know, the other thing is this, um, it's kind of a little bit in here, but just the bias that is somewhat inherent with these systems. We were also just, we were talking just the other day about, so these large language models are continually learning to become more accurate and more correct and, and give you the, the, you know, the right answer. And yet, sometimes the people 
that are adding the data might have their own biases, might be putting in wrong data. And so it's kind of like this, this struggle between the continuous learning, but also ensuring that it's accurate data being fed to the system. Yeah, and of course, the model is only as good as the data what goes into the training of that yep. model, right? Yeah. So. so now a lot of people seem to think um, that, you know, ChatGPT, Google Bard, Bing is the generative AI, but there are only applications, right, that then query these large language models. So yeah, there's a kind course. of a separation there. Yeah, there's a there's there's a model on the back end, and there's a, these are only public tools would allow you to interact with the model, run inferences, you know, have the model generate the certain content in response to the user's prompt, and uh, you know, if you look at the uh, at the at the process, the, the training process of those of those models, what goes into the training set? Well, they say it's. Uh, they call it a demonstration data set, right? It's just there's a, they insert the prompt and um, they kind of uh, mimic the response of the model. They run through uh, through the model and then mark uh, the, the output, the output A, B, C, as which would be the most appropriate output for the uh, for that given prompt, right? But again, and they said, you know, they employ uh, the main experts to analyze these answers and mark the the, the correct one or the most appropriate one. But those experts may have bias. So yep. we don't know whether that answer was labeled correctly or not. Or maybe there is some prejudice. So we'll keep moving. Keep, we've got to continue to keep moving along. Cause and one I more don't thing here. The yeah, sorry. Um, ah. The one more thing in the demonstration data set is what uh, that is not only taking uh, from that the person who actually generates that prompt and um, in the response to that prompt, but also from you know other users who are using the model. So once you have that chat GPT going, you type something, it goes into your history. If it's in the history of the chat, it can be used in the training uh, of that particular model. So yep. dangerous stuff. Although uh, recently at the White House, there's the President's Council on Science and Technology have now pretty much formed a little working group advisory panel. You know, as this technology continues to integrate into all of our stuff, um, there's got to be a way to control it. There has to be a way, of course. Um, so now we've been, you know, all along kind of talking about human input and the stuff that employees may paste into a generative AI model. But there's also, I was reading that organizations, as we, you know, one of the stats earlier, are already incorporating this into their systems and then potentially even incorporating new vulnerabilities into their system. So OWASP recently came out with their top 10 for the large language models. Now you see it's only, you know, an early version 1.0, 101, I think. Dot one. But I guess the point about this is the current setup, particularly web application firewalls that are there to protect your applications and systems, are really not tuned currently to handle many of these kinds of vulnerabilities or ways to get in. Yeah, of right? course, yeah, because if you hide the, the model behind the WAF or any other tool with uses signatures, it just it completely it's completely useless because to understand these type of attacks like a prompt injection or the training data poisoning on some others, you need to understand the context, yep. what actually goes into the payload, what goes into the model. And currently like tools would use signatures, they're just not capable of understanding the context of that data. So there has to be a better way to protect the LLMs and also protect the end users from the consequences uh, of these attacks, right? If, if I inject a certain malicious prompt, then make the model you know, run the inference on the other user and spit out the, the result, which would contain a uh, malicious link, an efficient link, or even piece of malware. So uh, there has to be a way to combat that, right? Yeah. 
So like they could probably do some things like maybe the injection thing, maybe denial of service, and maybe to some extent data leakage, just the exfiltration of data blocking kind of sensitive stuff. But otherwise, it could be a wide open field for those looking to attack a system with a large language model behind it. Or a, Yeah, but know. the attacks like a CSRF, I keep fitting the model with with uh, phishing link over and over and over again. The chances are it's going to spit out that phishing link sooner or later to a random user or the user group. And that creates a real problem right now. I know they're working to enhance and kind of uh, you know protect those models as well, but it's, uh, it's a real problem right now. Yep. So what do we do about this, Serge? Well, there uh, there's has to, like I said, there has to be a better way to protect the uh, data, especially. And we're talking about the data. We can be talking about uh, Gen AI, language models, you know, all day long and how to protect those. Uh, but here at the, uh, the uh, Cradle Point, we're focusing on how to protect the data from being exposed to the uh, Gen AI tools. And, uh, you know, we use... Uh, we use certain things and the technologies uh, with, uh, with the Ericom has brought um, as, uh, you know, as, as a part of the technological product to the Cradle Point uh, to perform just that. Yeah. Know? But in general, as you can see, you know, organizations should really, you know, they want to throw everything at it. But the ones that will benefit the most, the ones that keep information secret and not leaked out because they might be required by regulatory reasons. And then all of the governance around because even like user training i mean user training with phishing for crying out loud you can have enough user training there is and still like five percent of the people are going to get their itchy click a finger and get fished no problem so Johnny it's going to be we're going to have yeah. we're going to have like corporate training on how what you should not put into a gen ai system but inevitably someone's going to do it oh of course and some companies just uh uh, try to block the usage of the Gen AI altogether, and uh, that's not just the way to go. There's a lot of companies understand with it's a, it's a whack-a-mole game, right? It's just they block ChatGPT and some other tools, but thousands of other tools like they appear every day. So the only way to deal with that is to embrace the technology and make sure there's a, a safe uh, safe way to consume that technology, right? And the training is not an answer. There, there, are, there, are, there have to be tools in place that deal with this uh, situations. There's true no that. training, you know. It's like a, true that. A, yeah, Johnny <laughs> clicks a lot, right? It's just one person, you know, is all copies and pastes that information, and boom, your, your, your IP, your trade secrets are out there in the public domain. Yep. So you want to talk just a little bit about our architecture and how we go about uh, protecting against the generative AI? Yeah, so uh, at Mericom, uh, we use what we call the remote browser isolation uh, to protect the data from being exposed to the Gen AI. So what we do is uh, we actually run the containers in the cloud, which are air-gapped, and the end user, when the end user accesses those Gen AI tools, the end user doesn't actually uh, have that rendering done in the local browser. Instead, that rendering of the whole website is done in the in a container what is air gap in the cloud. Now, what user sees is a, is a stream of pixels, and a clean uh, stream of pixels. And because we do that, we have full control of what goes in and out of that session, particularly from the customer side. Uh, you know, we control the clipboard, we control the file sharing, upload, download. We can scan the files for antiviruses. We can do a CDR, what's called a content disarm, and reconstruct where if there is a piece of malware embedded in somewhere in a PDF, we can just take it apart, rip out that malware, and put it back together, and the, the end user actually downloads the clean file. Uh, you know, we can, uh, we can also apply a, uh, a DLP policies or data loss prevention, like if the user just types manually something or uploads the file that contains the IP or you know, proprietary information, that can be detected and the file can be blocked or the user will be prevented from sharing that data with the, uh, with the, um, with the Gen AI tool. And this is based on, I don't know if you guys are familiar with remote browser isolation yeah. technology. And so it's these, these cloud containers 
and it's taking the data from the application, basically rebuilding it in a container and it doesn't go directly to the end user's device in their browser. They're actually, as Sergey mentioned, are just reading the pixels from this cloud container. So if there's someone wants to attack the session yeah, or attack so. the, the data, they're actually only attacking this, this little cloud container that gets blown away as soon as you close the uh, browser tab. And we do have, I know the, these ones like demos. We got a short demo, I think it's only like three minutes or something yeah. like that, yeah. to just kind of walk you through some of the examples that yeah. we've talked about. And yeah, We uh, have five minutes left, I think a couple minutes for questions as well. So. Let's go ahead and uh, so the first of all, like uh, there are certain tabs open in the browser and the first tab would be like my team's channel where I just copy some text arbitrarily uh, and I would like to paste that text, you know, somewhere. I would like to reward that text with the generative AI tool and the chat GPT. So in the C in the clipboard viewer, you'll see the content of my clipboard. Now because I'm using what we call the local clipboard in this case, you know, I can move that text freely in between different tools, like the Teams and uh, the Notepad and things like that. But if I try to paste it into, let's say, the ChatGPT, I won't be able to because that particular um, the tab uses the protected clipboard. Now, this online Notepad also uses that protected clipboard and they actually share that clipboard, but it's not shared with my local machine, with my local clipboard. And that's the point. I can't just take something from my internal resource and paste into the uh, Gen AI tool, for example. But here, I look at this, the Mac Rumors website, just copied some text and it doesn't show up in my local clipboard, but it is in my remote protected clipboard, which I can use to you know, to paste uh, the content and, you know, whatever arbitrary, uh, you know, tabs I have opened would uh, apply the same policies basically and have the same clipboard type applied. So that includes the chat GPT, my notepad, some other arbitrary websites I open uh, in the browser. And uh, those tabs can be side by side, by the way. This, uh, you know, we can open one directly in the browser, do all the rendering directly in the browser. And then some other uh, tabs would, will be using the RBI, and those will be using a different uh, clipboard. Now, if we can just generate some content from, let's say, ChatGPT, and then we can use that response again um, to, I mean, it's like to share the somewhere, or you know, that, that was just a joke, uh, but any type of inference you know, can be copied and you know pasted uh, into the uh, into the tab which shares the same clipboard type. So essentially, there are two different clipboards which we maintain, and that actually helps a lot with managing data and how data is shared with the Gen AI tools. So what about somebody entering like you know just off the cuff like a credit card number or a social security number? Or Something yeah, like that. Of course, yeah, that can be filters as well through the DLP policies. Uh, and I think uh, I should show it somewhere uh, in this demo as well, how we apply those DLP policies. I'll try to uh, upload one of the files what contains a sensitive information inside, and just a doc file, what happens to have a social security number inside. And if I try to upload it, Using those DLP policies, it's going to run the DLP check. And it'll see what it's going to detect, what is the social security number in the file, and it will actually prevent me from sharing that file with the remote um, the site which uses different type of clipboard. Same thing, if I go and upload that file to uh, WriteSonic or some other tool uh, which you know, helps rewrite articles and things like that, uh, there are some other policies which may be applied, like completely disabling the sharing of the file, like completely disabling the file upload. So if you don't want to deal with that, if you don't want to check the files, you can just completely block it from being uploaded. The same goes for manually typed data. It's not in the demo, I know, um, but I think it's in the other demo we did 
uh, somewhere in uh, it's on the YouTube, on our right? YouTube, yeah. We'll put that in the after. We like to do videos, so. But so there, managing upload or controlling, I should say. So really putting in a lot of restrictions. So allowing employees, organizations to use the tool to benefit the organization for those things that a company seems or deems less risk averse, but certainly being able to block those things that are well beyond uh, what the company wants to get leaked out. Yeah. Don't block Gen AI, just uh, embrace it, <laughs> use it safely. Gen needs a hug. <laughs> All right, any questions? session right on time you can visit us either at cradlepoint.com ericom.com sometime in the over the course of the next year we're all going to be combined as one and we're all as a matter of fact part of ericsson so um maybe at some point we'll be we'll be wearing the ericsson logo but for now we're happy with cradle point in ericom we have five minutes. Thanks, Would everyone. Would you like to ask any questions? Oh, we get an applause. How's that? Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining. It's the, uh, by the way, it's the at Ericom Zero Trust Security Channel, where a much longer demo about how to protect organizations of uh, data leakage into Gen AI. Boom. That's a wrap.